The following video was sponsored by the Greek American Heritage Society of Philadelphia, preserving and promoting our community's history. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is George Grigos? <laughs> George is a uh, multifaceted and I've done many things in my lifetime, fortunately. And I enjoyed every day of it. And I loved the food business, because I grew up in the food business. Okay. Um, tell us uh, about the food business that, you, that you've known and you've obviously worked in for however long in your life. Lifetime. <laughs> lifetime. Doing a life sentence. Doing a, tell us a little bit. Well, it started out when I was young, um, and I was fortunate that around the corner from where I lived, my mom and the people that lived around the corner were from the same small town in Manesson, Pennsylvania, where my grandfather was a crane operator operating an, in an iron mill, which I could never understand if this man immigrated to America, and he couldn't speak a word of English, how could he operate <laughs> a heavy piece of machinery that pours molten stainless steel steel into a mold? I found that amazing. But the man that lived down the street from us in Philadelphia also lived down the street from my mom in Manesson, Pennsylvania. So they became, they grew up as friends. And ever since then, uh, they were reunited again. My mother got married and left and went to New York. And I had two sisters that married, uh, that they moved, they, had, they were born in Brooklyn and they came to Philadelphia. And I was born here in Philadelphia. And as our life progressed, we moved to the Northeast, and the person who was around the corner was Nick Fisfis, food distributor in Philadelphia. And um, I was nine years old, and my father had passed away. And Nick and my mom were good friends. So Nick said, let me bring him with me during the summertime, and just so that he gets to get out and see what's going on out there. Actually, I got into food business like this. I was nine years old, and my mother and a friend that she grew up with, who lived right around the corner, was a very nice man and took me under his wing, and we went with him as a food distributor, and that's what he did for a living. And I would help him and carry the boxes into the restaurants, and I would watch at the first stop, and let's just say they're making beef stew. I saw step one. Next stop, beef stew. Saw step two. And I got addicted to the food business. And I was very fortunate to have this experience. And this went on. It came through who though? Through Nick Fisfis. Very nice man. And he was, had a good heart and took me in under his wing and gave me the experience of being exposed to so many different restaurants and restaurant operations, whether they were diners or whether they were little pizza shops or even the little luncheonettes, I got to see how they operated. So the question is now, at nine years old, you were exposed to the food industry. Tell us about the food industry as you saw it with the Greek community first. The so people that we would deliver to were very kind and open because they sort of knew who I was because Nick would introduce me and I got to be known around town and they would welcome me in and they would give me a glass of milk or maybe a piece of pie just to be nice neighbors, good, good from the heart people. So working for Nick Fisfis, who was a distributor of, the, of foods, you got to see 
lots of restaurants, diners, delis and stuff. Tell us about some of them that you went and saw and where they were. We would go all through from Center City all the way up to Drexel Hill and then we'd work our way back down and that would be Monday and then Tuesday we would start maybe go Friday I remember was always we would go to New Jersey and do the diners of New Jersey and I got the experience and some of them were just opening brand new diners and Nick would take me with him and he'd say oh Nick we came to help you so he said Georgie peel some shrimp <laughs> I would peel the shrimp peel some potatoes I'd peel some potatoes so I got my hands on to do some of the dirty work but if you don't like the dirty work you're not gonna like the clean work you gotta earn it and this was at a young age I it, this was what I was exposed to and it was a wonderful experience and I did it for almost 10 years from 9 to 19 all right take us forward now from 19 on. At that point, I just had graduated, well, at 18, I graduated high school. I went to the Warwick Hotel as an apprentice chef. And of course, who took me under his wing was the chef, a shotty, honest to God, Galosini. He was the chef, and he, he wanted, he loved that I could speak some Greek. I wasn't fluent, fluent, but I learned a lot of my Greek in the kitchens. Maybe some of them were off color. But that's okay. <laughs> I learned my vocabulary was very good. And the chef really enjoyed me and took me by the hand and took me through two years worth of uh, apprenticeship in a year. Well, with that, I realized that I needed a little more education. And at that point, I went and lived with my aunt in Brooklyn, New York. And I went to New York City Community College, which was offering hotel technology, was the course that I graduated. And it was a great experience for me. And of course, the people that was working in, that I went to work with, were right across the street from the school. And I got to talking with the man, and once he heard my name, he said, I know your father. I knew your father. We grew up together here in Brooklyn. And I found it amazing. And we became close friends, and he offered me a position to help him out. So I would help out after school, and then I'd go to my aunt's, my Theodieta's house, and uh, go back to school and do my homework and do the best I could. And then one day I went into work and I see Jimmy on the counter and he's all upset and I said what's the matter Jimmy he said oh my uncle died I said I know your uncle I remember he was working in the kitchen he says yeah he was the chef but he died what am I gonna do I says you'll go back there and put the apron on and be the chef I never learned how to be the chef I said well whatever you want I'll do it he says you know how to do that I said yeah he says you can do that I said yes absolutely I can do it so I would go in 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd prepare a, a list. I said, you want beef stew? You want meatloaf? You want stuffed peppers? Whatever you want. You want gravies? And this, these are the soups. And he was in. So I had a job. I was his chef. I would run over at lunchtime because it was right across the street from the school. And I had this great position. But it wasn't enough for George. George wanted more. So from Jimmy's, um, I had an opportunity from school that they needed a maitre d' in Greenwich Village. And I said, wow, this might be a great experience to do, but will I be able to fit it into my schedule? So they said, no, you don't have to come in until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I worked till 11 o'clock at night. And I got to shower, shave, and put on my tuxedo, and greet the people at the door, which gave me a whole new understanding of the food business, the front of the house. I was specializing in the back of the house. So now, on my resume, I had, I understood the distribution, I understood the preparation, now I understood how to set up 
the seating arrangement, who, what waitress and waiter would work in what direction, and I had to oversee these operations. This operation in Greenwich Village, Dan Stampler's Steak Joint was a famous restaurant. So I was fortunate, but nobody wanted to work the weekends because there was no tips to be made. But I was just happy for the experience. So you did that? Yeah, Monday through Thursday, I would be the maitre d' at this restaurant. How long did you do this? While I was going through two years of high school, college. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, take us forward now. You, you were in college. You're working as a maitre d'. Yeah. What, was, what was the next part of your... Galosini, the next Galosini. thing that happened to me. <laughs> Jimmy said, I've never had the opportunity to go back to Greece. I want to go back to Greece, and I can't leave my son here, and I can't leave my wife here. So I can only trust you because I know that you've been able to handle this operation. So he says, can I take two weeks and go to Greece? I said, sure. You were so kind to me, I have to be give back. So I went and I took over the operation for two weeks. I get a telephone call. He says, how's everything going? I said, everything's fine. He says, I'm having such a wonderful time. Do you think I could stay for another two weeks? And I said, it's your business, sure. So I stayed for two more weeks because now college was completed. I was gonna come back to Philadelphia and I came back to Philadelphia with some extra money in my pocket. How old were you at this time? 20. 20 years old. And now you're back in Philadelphia, you're 20. What was about to happen for you? Fortunately, I saw an ad in the paper. It was a restaurant. It was actually not a restaurant. It was Philadelphia International Airport. I catered the planes. They gave me total lock, stock, and barrel, the keys to a 140,000 square foot building where I catered the planes. I had 160 employees that I controlled over. And I found out later that the people that owned it were Chef Sorkit from New York, who were Greek people. Galosini came back again into my life. They came down, introduced themselves to me. They said, we like what you're doing and you're saving us money. And I can't go into the details, but there were different things that I put into this operation. Then I went to the city of Philadelphia and asked them if they had any retired Board of Health people. And I said, can you give me their names and I can contact them? So he said, absolutely, what do you need them for? I says, I'm operating the Philadelphia International Airport, catering the planes, we're catering 5,000 meals a day. And I said, I'd like to have people from the Board of Health helping me so that we could keep up to the standard of Philadelphia and making sure that the people would keep to wash their hands, wear their hairnets, and the things that had to be keep up with the Board of Health. So they were amazed with that idea and the people from Chef's work, it came down again to say, how did you come up with that idea? I said, I was just fortunate and I know that that's what needed to be done because I couldn't oversee everything. Give us a time frame and take us forward now. You've been there? Two years there. My father-in-law, not at the time, my, I'll say my girlfriend's husband, father was William Moraitis, who he had married Catherine Moraitis, and they had the Aramingo Diner. This, this is 19, uh, 57 when they originally opened the Aramingo Diner and we're talking 1970, 1971, summer of 70. And I just fell into the business because my father-in-law says, ah, you're making peanuts over there working for the city, you know, working for the airport. Come here and I want to retire and you can take over the diner. I said, well, that sounds good. And, uh, I started to uh, back out of the airport and say to the P 
people that I was hiring. They didn't want me to leave. They wanted to give me more money. They wanted to give me another position. I said, I'm sorry, I got an offer I can't refuse. So I ended up at the Aramingo Diner at 21 years old. And my father-in-law, at, not at that point, his, I called him my father-in-law out of respect today. Um, Bill and Catherine wanted to take it easy and they turned the operation over to me. So we're talking um, 1971. By 1972, we got married and I had full reins of the diner. So it was a small, about 140 seat diner and uh, it was a Mountain View diner and it was a little bit tired. And I was trying to talk my father into these new diners that I had been mesmerized by through the years of my growing up and I would love to go to the diners. And uh, you know, I always would, would, would mark them and rate them on their hot beef sandwich or hot turkey sandwich or especially their coleslaw. If they didn't have good coleslaw, I said, ah, this place ain't gonna make it. But it was just my own little way of grading things. If the gravy was good and the beef was good and the french fries were good, well, that's gave me, this is what has to happen. We have to have good stuff. What's changed in the diners in the past, say, 10 years? I would say 10 years. They've gone through this metamorphosis and they've moved up to a different level. And now there's not only diners, but they're multi-unit diners. People have five diners, six diners. And I admire them because I remember I was a hands-on operator. I worked seven days a week. I wasn't afraid of work. But fortunately, I had a good team of people and things got better and my father-in-law invested in me and agreed to put a new Aramingo Diner on that location. And we went to the Raffley in New York and we ordered a whole new diner that would fit on our lot. When I took over the construction and the new setting of the Aramingo Diner in place, making the menu, making all of the setting up of the scheduling, I worked around the clock because I did not want to fail, A, and I wanted my father-in-law and mother-in-law to be proud, and I did it. And I turned it around, and I, we made like a little funny bet with my father-in-law that I said, I'm gonna double, maybe triple what we used to do. He says, you do that and I take care of you very good. So, I did it, and at the first week I took the slip out of the register and they said, there you go, Papu. How's that for you? He says, won't be long, it'll be your place. So he turned it over to me in 1981. And of course I made, paid the rent or I paid something to be back to Mike Alosini back for appreciation of this experience and the ability that I had. And I was fortunate but I also did work hard and I had the background. If I could explain it to you, every five years I would make a huge uh, party for the employees. And I would say, first I would invite the people that made the first year. And I said, this are, these are the people that made the first year. And I would point them all out and I'd give them like a little bit of a bonus. Then I would give honorable mention to all the people of five years. I'd give them a plaque saying this is a five year for dedicated service to the Aramingo. Then 10 years dedicated service. And then 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. And as the time went up, the bonuses got a little bit bigger. The, the, the thank yous got a little bit bigger. The roses, the flowers, the, the photos that we had and all the people were just so appreciative of being recognized as a good employee. And that's what I always would tell them. And I said to them, 
Never steal from me. If you're hungry and you don't have food to put on your table, come to me. I will give you the food to put on your table tonight. Don't steal. Kalosini. Kalosini. It's a magic word. And I learned it. So you had the diner. You were successful, reputable. Take us forward. What happened? 20 years? 30 years? How long? Well, 40 years, 50 years. 19, no, 2014. It was my time. I was 65 years old. I said, it's time for me to make some change. And while I was working all those years, I uh, decided that I would invest in some real estate. And I purchased the building it's across from us. I purchased the building behind us. I purchased another building. And some of those things I gave back to our community. It was a give back to the community. I thought that this was important. Back to my upbringing of Galosini. Give it back to the people that, you, that made you successful. And you did that through? I built a daycare. I built a kidney dialysis center. I was very fortunate to have these opportunities. And the people of the area have services at their disposal. And I'm proud to be able to do that, to give back. A lot of people don't see that. Give us one of your fondest memories of working in the diner, one of your experiences, or something that's very memorable to you. Wow. Well, I think it was the 50 year of the city coming out to the diner and recognizing the diner for being in business and employing people for 50 years. And one of our city council women was a waitress at the diner and time had gone by because she was a teenager or maybe in her 20s when my mother-in-law and father-in-law were operating the diner and she came back as a city councilman to be the person presenting us with this 50-year plaque and honor in, in the city of Philadelphia. So I, I was very proud. What do you think makes diners so special? Diners are so special because they zero in on America. This is not a Greek thing. This is American. This is America. Hot beef sandwich, turkey sandwich, club sandwich, burgers. What's America made of? It's made of sandwiches and hot beef sandwiches. And then they started introducing the higher end. We're going to make scallops and we're going to make seafood and they're going to make pasticcio. Then they started in introducing the Greek meals which gave the people a different f spin on the diner. Some of them did great with it. Some of them in the, right, in the right locations were good. In the wrong locations, where I was, maybe they ate stuffed cabbage because I had the Polish here. Maybe they would eat galumpkins, <coughs> as they call them. But you have to know your customer. You have to know your market. And that's why... Starbucks knows their market because they give you that not tasty coffee. <laughs> do you still visit diners today? And if you do, why? What's special about them? My son lives outside of D.C. So I go to the, all the diners I can bump into there that don't know me. So I can go in there and I can observe the operator. And there he is yelling at the waitress or yelling at the cook, hey, treja, can I move, you know? And I said, yeah, this guy's Greek. No doubt about it, it's a Greek diner. But you could see from the baked goods and you could see from the taste of the food, it was good. And I'd end up, I got three or four favorite diners down in that area of Washington, D.C., right outside in Virginia. Thank God we had great vendors in our community. The diner community would not have been what it is today if it wasn't for our vendors. Our vendors were so devoted to us as we were devoted to them. Example, 
Lacus Coffee Company was around from the early 20s, 30s. They had friends in New York, Vasilaros, that had their major... New York City was controlled by Vasilaros Coffee. John Vasilaros was relatives with Lacus Coffee Company. They taught them, they helped one another. They worked together. Even when Lacus Coffee had a fire at 1010 Wood Street, they still continued to make Lacus Coffee in New York and ship it back down to them so they could distribute and keep their customers accustomed to using Lacus Coffee. Now, Lacus Coffee made it through that period and they got bigger and better. But that happened the same thing to diners. Diners went out of business, they had problems, they brought in Lacus Coffee, they bailed out the next guy, they helped them with it, they gave them the free order for the first time and say, please use our product. And as time went on, they helped them. If they were a little bit behind on their bill, they said, we'll pick it up next month. That was just the Lacus Coffee. The Fisfuses, they ran a mom and pop operation, but they went from a 8,000 square foot warehouse to a 15,000 square foot warehouse to a 38,000 square foot warehouse where what? How did they get big like that? They got big because of the Calosini, because of the people working together with them. He helped them, they helped you. They worked together. Cedar Farms. Cedar Farms is a huge business. I remember Gus Bahidi on a truck, refrigerated truck delivering eggs to the streets up and down from Kensington Avenue all the way up to Front Street. I was there next to him seeing him unload it. That was just one man that helped. Now his son Peter operates a huge, huge, huge business. I don't know how many trucks, I don't know how many turkeys, I don't know, it's none of my business. But thank God they did well and they helped everybody. How so though? They helped them by giving them credit which most of them, during the recession time, didn't have the ability to go to the bank and say, can you give me a line of credit? And they'd look at you and say, well, you're a diner, you're a luncheonette, you're a restaurant. We don't give diners and luncheonettes uh, lines of credit. But the distributors that were doing big business were able to get and carry you through the time. So you didn't pay a month, you didn't pay them two months. By the third month, you paid. You started picking up. Once the thing changed, they stuck with you because they became what? They became indebted to you. We're, we're brother. It's that brotherhood of saying, you helped me when I was down. Jarocopo, same thing. He, I saw him with a hind quarter on his back walking down the street on Kensington Avenue, delivering to the restaurants. And he had helper, but that was enough. That wasn't enough. And he'd carry the cans of lard. They used to come in 50 five-gallon drums of, uh, of lard. Philly cheesesteak is a little bit more modern, updated today. But if it wasn't for chilled Philly cheesesteak, you'd be buying it from a distributor that didn't have the quality that they have. So they did a wonderful job. And back in the day, Vernelson's Bread, that's who distributed to all the diners back in the day. I'm talking, Vernelson's closed, I can't tell you what year, but I'll say maybe in um, 1980, I would say. Uh, Malice Pies. Malice Pies, in the early days, the diners didn't have bakeries. They were small. The, the little luncheonettes didn't have bakeries. They didn't have this kind of product. So Gussie had your Malice, which went under Malice Pies, used to deliver with his brother to all the restaurants. All kinds of pies, Boston cream, lemon meringue, coconut custard, everything, apple, cherry, blueberry, of course. But Kipseli used to bring you donuts, all the different kinds of donuts. Tambosati, I remember him bringing the, the, they would deliver the donuts all over Philadelphia and maybe even Delaware and maybe Jersey. I don't know how far he went, but what a hard worker. He used to be a fabulous person and help you out if you were short. Termac Chemical. Termac Chemical brought you in the dish machine, brought you in the racks, brought you in the stuff, and it was up front. All you did was to pay for the juice, the soap that came through. 
use his soap through the machine, he was happy. He gave you credit. He didn't have, you didn't have an investment to buy a machine for, I don't remember, $8,000 for a dish machine. He'd bring it and put it on place. He'd have the plumber install it. You had so much help. There seems to be a large history with the Greeks being involved. Would you say this all started um, in the 40s, 50s? When were the Greeks the most dominant or the biggest force when they finally gelled together? Now, the Greeks got together probably in the 40s and really took over the city. And they had the luncheonettes. They, had, they, had, they went from hot dog carts to luncheonettes. They went up that ladder. And they started out. I remember, I remember these people having a little luncheonette. And then five years later, I'd see them. Jimmy's Paper Plate. Jimmy Carivali had this restaurant at 15th and Sampson. It was, I think, Bookbinders was across the way. Maybe it was Chestnut Street. I don't remember the exact cross street, but it was on 15th Street. And he had a great operation. After several years, he had another one. He had another one in, in, in Maniunk, the big giant um, warehouse restaurant. He had another one in, in, in Balakinwood. I think he ended up with like 14 restaurants. We used to deliver. Day's Deli, terrific. They were terrific operators. They went from a small operation to a big operation. They wanted, they had that eye of the tiger. Do you think um, Greeks are uh, more dominant today, or do you think they've evolved and moved on to other industries, or do, how, do you, how do you see the entire industry with the Greek community involved? I see the Greek industry that has changed their ability because they don't want to be back in that hot kitchen. They, 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 that's where they started, and that's where they grew, and that's where their real love is, but they expanded and they expanded. And I say, they're not really in the restaurant business anymore. They're in the real estate business. They own so many properties that they have acquired because of their success. The restaurants were successful. They went on and th they knew what communities that were growing. They learned how to read the demographics of where the changes are going to be. And they'd go there and it opened another one and it opened another operation. And fortunately, they were they they ended up being very successful. And I admire them. God bless America. Were the diners or was your diner what gave you your American dream? And if so, how? I don't know if it's American dream. <laughs> or the Greek dream. <laughs> the greatest thing that I could imagine to do for my dream is to take my family to go to Greece this summer. I'm going to Greece with my whole family and we're going to have a wonderful time and I'm looking so forward to it because that's the Greek dream. It's not just me and my missus, but me and my children and grandchildren. What better way to end your retirement or start your retirement and say this is the way to go. Not that I don't like Florida in the winter, but it's the Greek dream. Are you living your American dream? I'm, Greek, live, I'm living the Greek dream. You're living the Greek. <laughs> Thanks for talking with us. Great to be here. For more information about sponsoring or viewing the interview series, visit the Greek American Heritage Society of Philadelphia online at gahsp.org.